Hey everyone, this is David Brown with the Migration Update for April 18th, 2024 from the Braddock Bay Hawk Watch. In yesterday's video, I mentioned how the Presque Isle Hawk Watch in Erie, Pennsylvania had had over 8,000 broadwings that should be headed our way, but actually that report mentioned that they had missed the start of the flight, and looking at Trektelin for the morning flight count that was there for the entire flight, they counted over 21,535 broadwinged hawks, so a huge number of broadwings that should be heading up past the Buffalo area and then over to Rochester. So with that in mind, we had a lot of anticipation for today's flight. Kim and I started out the day at the Braddock Bay East Spit, and you can see that the sand bridge connecting the spit to the barrier island is mostly underwater, but there's a little bit of sand where you can go out and stand. But a lot of the good sandbar habitat where things like shorebirds and gulls were hanging out is underwater now, so the birding isn't quite as good. From the East Spit, we had 44 species, and some of the highlights included three ruby crowned kinglets and a brown creeper. Next, we headed over to Braddock Bay Park, and we had a few minutes to spare, so we went down on the boardwalk. And we had nice looks at this swamp sparrow perched up singing its trilling song. And there was also an eastern meadowlark perched up in a tree, and throughout the day, we kept hearing a meadowlark sing, but I'm not sure if it was a real meadowlark or if it was a starling imitating a meadowlark. We went up on the platform to start the hawk watch at 9 a.m., and the weather was a bit of a roller coaster today, so there was a little bit of sunshine to start the day with favorable southwest winds, and we did start to get a little bit of a flight of broadwings. We had about 100 of them, and then the lake breeze kicked in and shut down the flight for a few hours. Eventually, the wind shifted back to that more westerly direction, and it was slow for a couple hours, and then it really started to pick up as we got into the early afternoon and we had a couple hours where we had a really big broad-winged hawk flight and then suddenly the lake breeze kicked in again. We held on to the flight line for a little bit with another big group of broadwings continuing by off to our left over to the parkway side. After that some people went into Frisbee Hill to scout but they weren't able to find a flight line. By that time it had become a little thicker cloud cover and so we just assumed the flight had shut down. Eventually, the winds did shift back to a more westerly or northwesterly direction, and we got a, a little bit of a broadwing flight, small numbers here and there, but not those huge kettles we had gotten earlier in the day. And it was pretty slow for the last few hours as we ended the day with thick cloud cover. Here was the first first of season bird that flew by today. It was somewhat distant, so the photo's not great, but we can see a medium-sized heron with some green and red coloration. You can see trailing legs and a neck curved into an S as it flies. This is a green heron. Here we have a raptor with a long banded tail, kind of thin, somewhat pointed wings, and an owl-like facial disc, a little bit of streaking to the upper breast. This is a northern harrier. And here's another northern harrier. This one's very plain underneath with no streaking and very unmarked in the patagial area. So this one is a juvenile. Here we have a hawk with a long tail and long wings with rounded tips. So we should be thinking excipiter. And the posture of this photo is a little funny. I think the bird was turning. Uh, so maybe the head looks a little larger than it actually was. Um, but if we look at the tail, look at the tail feathers. They all seem to be about the same length, all the way from these outer ones across through the inner ones, giving it a bit of a squared off appearance. And that combined with the small head, make this a sharp shinned hawk. Here we have a large dark raptor gliding overhead. In the photo, we can make out a white head and a white tail. This is an adult bald eagle. Here's another small excipiter. We see a small head and a very squared off tail and orange barring underneath, making this an adult sharp shinned hawk. We also see this bulge here. This is a full crop, meaning that it has eaten recently. Here's another adult bald eagle gliding overhead. And in this photo, you can see the white head and tail a little bit better. But often on these gloomy overcast days, it's really hard to see the white head and tail on adult eagles. Here we have a large, lanky, black and white raptor. We see a white head with a black line through the eye. This is an osprey. Here we have a group of four large, slow flapping birds. We see as they flap, their wings are very droopy. We see they have long trailing legs and necks that are curved into an S shape. These are great blue herons. Here we have a black and white bird with a very thick bill. We see a blue breastband underneath, but no brown. This is a male belted kingfisher. 
Here we have a perfect example of the silhouette of an osprey as it glides overhead. Now again, notice that black and white plumage overall underneath, and notice that some ospreys have a bit of a necklace. Here's another small hawk with a long tail and long wings with rounded tips. We should be thinking accipiter. Orange barring underneath indicates adult. We see a small head and a very squared off tail, making this an adult sharp-shinned hawk. And we also see that this one also has a full crop. Here we have a small buteo with somewhat pointed wing tips. We see a black tail with a wide white band. And we see some brown horizontal barring underneath, making this an adult broad-winged hawk. Here we have another adult broad-winged hawk, but look how ragged this one is. All of the tips of the feathers are really worn. Here we have a large dark raptor with three very distinct areas of white. We have a white patch in each wing and the base of the tail. Looking at the shape of this bird, we see that the wings pinch in towards the body, giving the wings a very rounded appearance. And we see that it has a very small head compared to the size of the tail. All of those features make this a golden eagle. And this is an immature golden eagle, probably a juvenile. And this is on the more extreme end of the spectrum in terms of having large white patches. This bird has a lot of white, a really beautiful, immature golden eagle. Golden eagles are great, but we didn't come out today to see golden eagles. We came out to see broad-winged hawks, and they sure did not disappoint. As we got into the mid-afternoon period, we had a few hours where kettles of broad wings started streaming by in groups of up to hundreds at a time. Really spectacular. They started out high to the lakeside and high overhead. Eventually, when the lake breeze kicked in, they were more high to the parkway side. So it was a bit of a challenging flight to count, but it was really satisfying views of large kettles of broad-winged hawks. And people often ask me, how do you count so many broad-winged hawks when they're circling in a big mass like that? And the answer is you don't count them when they're circling in a big mass like that in a kettle. You wait until they break off into a glide. So you can see here that they're all gliding in the same direction. So what you do is you kind of pick a point in the sky and use your hand clicker and count them as they go past that point. Now, sometimes that's easier said than done, especially if you have um, like sort of a widespread group where you might have a big kettle and they're gliding out of the top, but there's also a secondary kettle gliding out of the bottom. And sometimes they don't all fit in one binocular field of view or a scope field of view if they're distant. So sometimes they're tricky to count, but you do the best that you can. But you always prefer to count them when they're gliding out of the kettle rather than when they're circling and gaining altitude. Broad-winged hawks are one of our most spectacular migrants because they're our only hawk that migrates in large groups. And these are birds that come through in a relatively narrow window. It's a few week window where we get tens of thousands of them migrating on a long journey. They're coming from South America where they spent the winter and they're heading up to New England and Canada where they're going to spend the summer nesting. The number of broad-winged hawks we get in any given season is quite variable. Some years you might only get less than 20,000, and the record seasons are up more towards 100,000. So it's a species that we're always hoping to get the right winds so we can get the really big days. Today we had about 2,800 broad wings. It was the first big day of the season for them. So far we've had about 4,000 total for the season. I think the average is somewhere around 30,000 for the season. So there's still a lot of broad wings to come. The highest single day that I've personally had at Braddock Bay was around 12,500 broad wings. And the record days are more like 30,000 to 40,000. So those are the kind of days we always hope for. And still lots of broad wings to come. So if seeing these large kettles inspires you, I hope you're able to get out and see them over the next few weeks as we get to view this true spectacle of migration here in Rochester, New York. And don't worry, you don't have to count them. You just have to enjoy the experience while I'm busy counting them all. Here we have a small dark raptor. We see pointed wings, so we should be thinking falcon. And we see a dark tail with some white bands. This is a merlin. Here we have a large grayish tan bird with long trailing legs and a long neck held out straight with a long pointed bill. This is a sandhill crane. Here we have a large dark raptor high overhead. We see that the wings pinch in a little bit near the body, giving them somewhat of a curved appearance. We see a small head compared to the tail, and we can make out very faint white patches in the center of the wings. This is a golden eagle. Here's a bird that's two-toned underneath. We see a small reddish head and a medium length tail. 
This is a turkey vulture. And we had a pretty good flight of turkey vultures today with around 300. Here we have a hawk that is a beautio, but it's a little bit lanky. Those wings are a little skinny and long and a somewhat long tail. We see that overall the plumage is a combination of blacks and whites. So overall white, but we do see these stark squares in the carpal region and a lot of black here on the belly. This is a light morph rough-legged hawk. Compare that to this somewhat similar bird. Again, we see a bird with long, somewhat skinny wings and a longish tail. Overall light underneath but we see dark wingtips and a dark trailing edge to the secondaries. We don't see any black here on the underside of the leading edge of the wing, and there's no dark at all on the underside of the body. We see a grayish head. This is a male northern harrier, also called a gray ghost. Here's a hawk that gave us a terrific view right over the platform, but I had walked away from my camera, so I didn't get the really close shots, but as he went past, he turned, so I got a little bit of a close shot here, and we see that this is a bird with a long tail and long wings. Looks a little bit pointed just because they're tucked back, but this is an excipiter. We see a small head and a very squared off tail. This is a sharp shinned hawk. Here's a bird that was slightly larger than our typical swallows. We see very pointed wings, a bit of a forked tail, and a really deep blue or purple color underneath because this is a purple marten and it's a male. It's our largest species of swallow. And taking a look at the eBird checklist for the Hawk Watch, today we had 73 species. And also I like this new feature they added where you can click over here and only view the species where you uploaded photos. And I should also point out that golden eagles are now sensitive since we're coming into a season where they could possibly be nesting and they don't want people disturbing them. So uh, if you look at my checklist, you won't see golden eagle listed, but since it's my own checklist, I am able to see those photos. I had two new species for the season today, which were the green heron and an American bittern that popped up out of the marsh as I was scanning over towards the east spit. And if you've ever been on the platform when a bittern pops up, they don't stay up very long. They kind of pop up out of the marsh, fly for a little while, and then dive back in. So when I saw that it was a bittern, I started stuttering and stammering and trying to yell out what I was looking at. I, I think I got out bittern and east spit, and I think most people on the platform were able to get on it, thankfully. But some years that can be a tough bird to get from the hawk watch, so we were thankful to cross that one off of our list. Taking a look at the hawk count report for our migrant raptor totals, today we had 303 turkey vultures, 6 osprey, 10 bald eagles, 14 northern harriers. For excipitors, we had 113 sharp shinned hawks and 5 cooper's hawks. For beautios, we had 2,798 broad winged hawks, 16 red tailed hawks, and 1 rough legged hawk. We had three golden eagles, and we had the falcon trifecta with 14 kestrels, two merlins, and one peregrine for a total of 3,286 migrating raptors today. That brings the April total to 18,985, and the season total to 27,105. Taking a look at the forecast for tomorrow, it's looking cloudy with showers with a high in the low 60s. Winds will be south-southeast, shifting south-southwest at 10 to 20 miles per hour. So these are good southerly winds for us, especially as it gets into the afternoon and the winds swing around more to the southwesterly direction. That's our best wind direction, although we can do pretty well on southeasterly winds as well. My main concern for the day is just going to be the timing and the amount of that rain that's coming at some point in the midday period. Uh, I think there's a cold front that's going to pass through, or it might technically actually be an occluded front, and that's going to bring the rain associated with it. And then after that passes, towards the end of the day, it might start to clear up a little bit as the winds get a little bit stronger and maybe more westerly. So the main question just comes down to, is it going to be too gloomy and rainy to keep the broad wings from flying, or are conditions going to be enough with those somewhat strong winds that the broad wings are going to push through regardless? It could very easily end up being another day like today where we have a short window where we have a really big flight and then the rest of the day there's not really that much happening. I guess it will be up to everyone individually to decide how much tolerance they have for wanting to take the chance of seeing a big flight versus possibly waiting all day and not seeing much of anything. Again, there were 20,000 plus broadwings that went through Erie, Pennsylvania yesterday, and those birds are somewhere, and southerly winds should be bringing them up to the lake shore of Lake Ontario and through the Rochester area. So 
We'll cross our fingers on getting a big flight, but it's a little bit hard to predict. We'll just have to see how the exact weather turns out. But being the peak of the adult broad-winged hawk migration with southerly winds, this isn't the kind of day where I'm going to go out and, oh, it started raining, time to leave. I'll be out there all day waiting for things to happen. And even if it is a bit rainy, and even if we're not seeing broad wings with those southerly winds, we could still get a lot of sharp-shinned hawks and kestrels and harriers pushing through down low through the rain. Uh, they're willing to tolerate those kind of conditions more than species like broad wings, which usually prefer a bit of sunshine to soar on thermals. So it's looking like a high risk, high reward kind of day. So we'll cross our fingers to get a big flight, but there's also the possibility that it turns out to be a huge bust. And then for the weekend, we're going to have those post cold front conditions for Saturday. It's looking partly cloudy and then cloudy with the high in the upper 40s and winds westerly at 15 to 25 miles per hour. So that's a decent wind for us. It's not as favorable as a southwest wind, but that's a good wind that pushes a lot of birds through. Uh, it's a little bit on the stronger end than we prefer, especially for broad wings. Sometimes uh, the strong winds can disrupt the thermals, but I bet we'll have a pretty good flight. And then again for Sunday, intervals of clouds and sun with a high in the low to mid 50s and the same somewhat strong westerly winds. So I would imagine that Sunday's flight will be somewhat similar to Saturday's. And again, we're right in the peak of the adult broad winged hawk migration. And we know that there's huge numbers in the region. So sometimes the exact conditions don't have to be perfect. If the birds are in the area, they'll push through and we can end up with really, really big days with thousands of broad wings or if we're lucky, sometimes even tens of thousands. All right, well, I hope that's enough information for you to make an informed decision about what days you want to visit soon. And I kind of like days like tomorrow where it's really uncertain if, if you're going to get the big flight or not. And uh, I think there's a certain excitement to that. But for people planning longer trips, sometimes they want a little more certainty. But if you're a risk taker, maybe come out tomorrow and see if we end up getting a big number of broad-winged hawks out of the Braddock Bay Hawk Watch. And regardless, I hope to see you out soon. From Lyco Birds, this is David Brown. Thanks for watching.